thanks to the guys from Mind Maze for uh, asking me to come and talk about upper limb rehabilitation. So it's a really, it's a, always a nice opportunity to kind of air what I think the really important issues are in this field. And I think it's something that we don't talk about enough. I think it's a huge challenge. So, so let's get into it. So here's a statement that you don't see often about stroke, but I think if we accept that stroke is a chronic and progressive disease, then it makes it much clearer what a huge burden it is, what a huge problem it is that we're facing. And one of the, one of the problems that we have in stroke is it's perceived often by patients and sometimes by um, clinicians as well that it's a one-hit problem. People have their stroke, they go home to recover, but it's a chronic and a progressive disease. 17 million people around the year experiencing first stroke. That's about one stroke every two seconds. Survival is, of course, improving, but we still have uh, a lot of survivors who uh, need further um, input. It's a huge economic burden, so really it is time to turn our attention towards treatments that promote recovery rather than focusing just on that early phase, which I think is, is a mistake. And one of my other bugbears is that one of the, the other problems that we have in stroke is that research in stroke, um, despite you know, great organisations who are trying to fund it, it lags behind things like dementia coronary heart disease and cancer, cancer, but it is you know, an equally big problem. So I want to talk to you about this, uh, so Freedom talks a little bit about proportional recovery rule, and I think anyone who's interested in thinking about recovery after stroke, this probably applies to all kinds of domains, but this is specifically for the upper limb. Anybody who's interested in recovery and rehabilitation needs to know about this, uh, this result. So this has been replicated now in several studies, so I think it's coming close to being true. So what you're looking at here is each of the dots here represents a single patient. And we have uh, an observed change. So this is change in upper, the fugal mile, we could just call it upper limb function. Upper limb function at three months post-stroke. And the prediction here is that patients will regain 70% of what they've lost. Okay, so that's a very specific prediction. So if you think about the fugal mile score, 66 points is the maximum. If at 72 hours post-stroke your fugal mile score is zero, this predicts that you will get 70% of those points back, so your score will get up to about 46. If your fugal mile score is 56 at day 3 post-stroke, you've lost 10 points, you're going to get 7 points back, your score will get up to 63. Incredibly specific, how could that possibly work? So for patients who are mild to moderate, that's these patients here, that works incredibly well. So at 72 hours post-stroke, we know pretty much exactly where somebody's arm is going to be at 3 months post-stroke. That's a very challenging result, I think, to rehabilitation. And we haven't quite worked out what we're going to do about it. It doesn't work for people who present with severe upper limb impairment. So if your fugal mile score is about 20, 19 or below, then you're in this category here. So some do well, some do badly. And I think this kind of result accounts for why clinicians think they're quite good at predicting outcome here, but they know that they're actually they're not that good. So we're not very good at predicting outcome after stroke. So I, what I think this result uh, tells us is what the, the questions are that we have to go after. So there's two things, okay? One, how do we turn these non-fitters into fitters? Okay, if we did that, that would make a huge difference to the field. And how do we turn 70% into 80% or 90%? So I think those are the two major challenges. And if you think that this is just something that's specific about the, uh, about the upper limb, this has now been published for visual spatial neglect, there are some data to say that it's the same for aphasia and probably also the same for walking. And what's really interesting, although this isn't yet published, but it looks like if you're a non-fitter for the upper limb, you'll be a non-fitter for aphasia. So there's something biological about the fact that you're not going to recover across domains. Okay, so what are we going to do about it? So the first thing is behavioural intervention. So the mainstay of rehabilitation is a behavioural intervention, be it upper limb, physiotherapy, uh, OT, speech and language therapy. So this is a report that's just come out about the burden of stroke in Europe from uh, King's College in London, and it, it, it's making the right noises, so we need a step change in the provision of rehabilitation, good, we all agree with that. And then it has this phrase here, and receive appropriate levels of therapy both in hospital and following discharge. I have a problem with the word appropriate, I think it's, it's just too vague, I don't know what appropriate means, appropriate for who. So if we look at the Royal College of Physicians, this is a little bit uh, more specific. But it talks about 45 minutes here. Again, it says the appropriate therapy, but uh, at a frequency that enables people to, to meet their rehab goals for as long as they're willing and capable of participating and showing measurable benefits. So this is more like you've just got to keep going. Although we still don't know where 45 minutes has come from. That's an arbitrary number, right? 
and measurable uh, uh, benefit is, is a tricky idea. Exactly what is it we're measuring? Are we measuring at the level of impairment, activity, participation? Which of those is important? Of course, they're all important. So how are we getting on? So these are SNAP data. So this is basic UK stroke audit data looking at the amount of uh, physiotherapy that our patients are getting. So here it says that 85% of people require physiotherapy, that the average uh, number of minutes a day was 35 minutes of physiotherapy a day, and that 74% uh, of those, uh, of, um, uh, that was delivered on 74% of the day. So if you look at the average length of stay in an acute stroke unit, 17 days, so we can work out the patients are getting just under seven and a half hours of physiotherapy. Not a lot, is it? What do you think it is for speech and language therapy? Higher or lower? Lower. Four and a half hours. Okay. So these are basically homeopathic doses of a behavioural intervention. So Judy Bernhardt published a study called Inactive and Alone, probably over 13 years ago, uh, and it said that patients were basically inactive and alone when on stroke units. So we can say, well, things have changed, right? We're much better. That, that doesn't happen anymore. This is a study that was published in 2015 by Kate Haywood. Same kind of idea, but fo focusing a bit more on the upper limb here. So in terms of the, the, the amount of time that patients were spent engaged in an active upper limb um, activity, uh, it, within a session, less than four minutes in a physiotherapy session and 11 minutes in an occupational therapy session. If you're interested in repetitions, if you're a mouse, you need to be doing about 400 repetitions to see stuff changing in your motor cortex, 32 repetitions in a session. So even when they are with therapists, they're not getting the right dose. So we're going to look at four studies now which have tried to address this issue about dose, increasing the dose of upper limb rehabilitation. I'm going to show you two that were started in the early phase and two that were started in the chronic phase. And in each category, there's one good and one bad. Okay, so let's see if you can spot the good one and the bad one. So this is a very well-known study. You need to know about this if you're interested in upper limb rehab. This is the eye care study. This is an American study that cost $12 million. So that's the amount of funding that they got. And they decided that they were going to go after intense upper limb rehab. So intense upper limb rehab for them was three hours a week for 10 weeks. Okay, so this is a $12 million study. It was... Um, there were some ideas about motor learning, but it, it, it doesn't really matter. They were going to do an extra... Uh, three hours a week for 10 weeks. And as you can see here, th this is, they started about 45 days post-stroke, so it started quite early. So this is just the natural improvement that you would see over that time. But as you, the important point is there's no difference between the control group, which in the States is basically nothing. You know, they don't really get much rehab. It's, you know, it's bad over there as well, compared to this so-called intense therapy. So three hours a week for 10 weeks is not doing anything. Okay, this is a much smaller study. Uh, Chinese study, much uh, not quite as well known. So they went after a bigger dose here. So they're going after uh, one, two, or three hours uh, a day, five days a week for six weeks. So the top group here, getting an extra three hours, are getting 90 hours over six weeks. Okay, so what kind of effect are we seeing? So let's skip down to the six-week post-treatment data. So this is the Fugger-Meyer scores here. So here you can see 13 for group A who are getting one hour, and the Fugger-Meyer score here is 24. Uh, so there's a difference about 11 and a half points there. And what you need to know about the Fugger-Meyer score is the minimum clinically important difference is somewhere between five and seven. So this is, if you give an extra, if you give three hours compared to one hour, you're getting an extra 11 and a half points on the Fugger-Meyer score, starting at about 40 days post-stroke. That's a huge change, okay? So this is an aspirational study. They went after a big dose, not in huge numbers, but as a proof of concept, you can change people by big amounts if you throw big amounts of therapy at them. Okay, in the chronic phase, so what have we got? So these are two, again, well-known studies, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet Neurology, robot studies. So just to cut to the bare bones, 36 hours over 12 weeks, 18 hours over eight weeks. And again, looking at the Fugamire, so a measure of impairment. So robots versus matched therapy, in other words, the same number of hours of physiotherapy didn't make any difference. Robots versus usual care. What do you think usual care is in chronic stroke patients? Nothing. Two points on the Fugamire score. So the robots give you an extra two points. Two points on the Fugamire score is noise. It's not, it's, you know, it, that's just statistical error. So there's essentially no change. This study over here, robots versus matched, again, didn't really make any difference. So this kind of dose, 30 hours, 18 hours over uh, this intensity, is not making a difference. 
Okay, here's an aspirational study. This is a study that people in the field don't know about. I think the reason that they don't know about it is because the title of the, uh, uh, this paper goes, extends over four lines, and it's just too long to read. By the time you've got to about stimulation, you've kind of lost the will to live, and you don't get to the end of it. But actually, it is a study worth looking at, because what they went after was 300 hours of upper limb therapy in chronic stroke patients, okay, delivered over 12 weeks. 300 hours, okay, not... 45 minutes a day for, for once a week for six weeks, 300 hours. And the kind of changes they saw, again, it doesn't matter about the different groups, motor learning, there's a bit of FES in there, a bit of robotics, it didn't really matter. They just gave a lot of stuff. And they were getting changes between 8 and 11 points on the Fugamai. Those are big changes, okay, in chronic stroke patients. We've been told for years chronic stroke patients cannot be changed at the level of impairment. Well, if Fugamai score is an impairment measure, we can change them at the level of impairment. So what do, we, what do we do at Queen Square? So this is not a study, this is an NHS uh, service that we provide. So we kind of tried to put all of the things that we thought we knew into a, an NHS service. So we bring people in, we, they come in every day for three weeks, their timetable for 90 hours over three weeks. And if you just look at the Fugamaya score, we're getting changes from admission to six months post-discharge of about 10 points on the Fugamaya score on our first 90 or so patients. So the interesting thing here, we were told, people said, well, you might change them here, but of course they'll go back to where they were at six months. But they don't, they keep on improving. And we can discuss why that might be later. Okay, so the summary bit for upper limb, we don't give enough to know what is possible through training. So I don't know how we can plan clinical services if we don't know what's possible. Simple task-specific training doesn't seem very effective to me, and I think we get that from the robotic studies. So I think we need to be treating people at the level of impairment, activity, and participation, and that way you get much better buy-in from patients when they go home, or when they leave the program, you train them in function, they will introduce what they've learned into functional tasks, their dose will effectively go up hugely, and I think that's partly why we get that increase post-discharge. So this idea of dose response is kind of emerging from clinical trials, we need to think very carefully about how we pick our outcome measures. Okay, this is a, this is a huge, uh, uh, it's not even seen as a problem, but we're, mis we're, we're mixing and matching our outcome scores. If you're doing a treatment which you think is working on the brain, it's going to work at the level of impairment, pick an impairment score. If you have a study where you, you're interested in whether you can get people out of the house, with whatever your intervention is, don't pick an impairment score, pick a participation score. So match your outcome score to your intervention. That's something that we absolutely don't do. And I think the, some of the funders, NIHR for example, don't understand that. We need aspirational studies. We do not need pragmatic studies anymore in rehabilitation. The eye care study, the American study, was, an, was a, a pragmatic study. So what I mean by that is if it was positive, they could have rolled it out into the American healthcare system as it currently existed. We don't need that. What was thrombolysis? What was thrombectomy? Those are not uh, pragmatic studies. Those are aspirational studies. Thrombolysis could not be delivered in stroke services as they existed, certainly not in the UK. <coughs> so those results drove a change in the organisation of healthcare systems. That is what we need in rehab. But it's very difficult to get that message across. It's very difficult to get that kind of uh, um, um, study funded. But we need something that is going to tear up the rules and change the way we deliver healthcare uh, in a rehab setting. How are we doing? Have I, have I ranted on enough? Okay, so just very quickly, because I was asked to do future perspectives as well. So I'm going to just say very briefly, because we don't have time to go into these things in detail, uh, about these, these are the four things that I think are to do with future perspectives. So dose. So dose is kind of the theme of this, of, of this session, right? So we'll talk about that. We don't talk about the timing of the intervention and plasticity modification and stratification, which is what Friedhelm was talking about. So in terms of dose, how do we get the dose up? We need more therapists, but of course one of the things that people are becoming interested in is using technology in order to engage patients and basically to get them to do more. So we have uh, companies like MindMaze, uh, Virtualware who are coming up with products. We have hardware such as uh, from organisations like Tyromotion and Acoma with robotic devices again to get people to do more. The benefits are essentially uh, you can have the option of mass practice, high repetitions, high dose, repeatability. We're not quite there with the gaming aspects I think of technology but ultimately we want them to be motivating and rewarding. You want patients to feel like they're immersed 
in this, uh, uh, in this environment, and that will drive them to uh, increase their own dose. And ultimately, I suppose, we're thinking about how we can get some of this stuff into people's own home. But that, I think that's a challenge, but it's, a, it's an aspirational challenge. We're going to have to think about cost, how it's costed across uh, different uh, healthcare uh, systems. We need to think about the evidence. I'm not saying there is no evidence, but we need to think about how we collect the evidence. So I'll give you an example. You know, I think a study that, that pitched uh, a bit of technology versus a physiotherapist and said which is better, I don't think that's a good study. I don't think that's a good question. Why would we want to know the answer, is a robot better than a physio? Because that's absolutely not how we would use it in clinical practice. Any of you who've got access to any of these technological devices, that's not how you use it in clinical practice. So setting up that question is a silly question, and it's a silly study to do, but there are studies like that. So you have to think very carefully about what is it the evidence that we want to provide. So for example, if you said, well, we accept that doing more hours is a good thing. It's not the only thing, you know, we need to think about others, but for where we are now, just getting people to do more hours is our outcome measure. Then maybe your outcome should be, can we get people to do more hours? That would be, I, I would find that compelling as a first start. And where to get appropriate advice. That's not just for, uh, well, it's both for healthcare professionals and for patients. I mean, I think that is also a huge problem. We forget, we come to these meetings, we see these things, we feel like we know what we're talking about. But there's a huge number of people out there clinicians, but also uh, stroke survivors, who don't, this is a complicated world, and you know, I've been to meetings where people have said, well, tell us what the best robot is, or the best, you know, we, we haven't got a clue, actually, the stroke survivors probably have a better idea, because they've probably tried more things than we have, so we need, together, in combination with all parties, to increase our experience of, uh, of what to do, and um, how to use these things. Okay, uh, timing, do you go early after stroke? Do you go late after stroke? Again, we don't have any evidence, but it's a, it's a question that we absolutely need to answer. And the reason that, of course, it's interesting is because we talk about this thing called spontaneous biological recovery, which is a window of opportunity after focal brain damage within which behavioral training has a much greater impact than outside that window. So in other words, if you go after people early after stroke, it may be that the same amount of the behavioral intervention will have a much bigger effect. So heightened plasticity. It's definitely true in animal models of stroke, it's probably true in humans, but we don't have any direct evidence. The other thing to say in relation to that is the window does not shut. People's brains do not suddenly lose the capacity for plasticity after this mythical three-month period. I had a patient once who was told that after three months you will have no recovery. She had that day served within her diary. Is that absolutely crazy? The brain remains plastic, it just loses this kind of hyper-plastic ability. We know that if you train chronic stroke patients in a task, they will improve on that task. You just need to train them on the right task. Plasticity modification kind of follows on from this. So this idea that we have an increase in plasticity, which kind of uh, then goes away, is being challenged a bit by people like Andrew Clarkson, who was here in the room and gave a talk yesterday, say that maybe there's a decrease in the potential for plasticity through increased tonic inhibition, and uh, there are conflicting ideas in animal models. We've got no idea which of these happens in humans. And the reason that we need to know is because we have drugs that can influence both of these processes ready to go in humans now. So clinical trials of recovery-related drugs. And people are starting to think about doing that, but they have no idea which of these processes is going on in the patient that they're going to give this drug. So we need to understand this better. And the last thing I want to say is about the stratification thing, and that comes in this idea of prediction. If we go back to the proportional recovery rule. If you look at those patients with severe presentation, some of them do well, some of them do badly. And at the moment, we've got no idea, really. There are some emerging data that say that these people have got more damage to the cortical spinal tract. But imagine if you put these people into a clinical trial and we stratify based on initial impairment. You're going, you, you may skew your two groups in, with good recoveries in one and poor recoveries in the other without knowing it. Now, to compensate for that, you need about 450 to 500 patients in a clinical trial. That's a big number. It's not impossible, but it's a big number. If we had predictive models adding in things like brain structure, maybe even brain function, to initial impairment and had a much better idea about how to predict outcome, we could stratify based on expected outcome, exactly as they do in acute studies, and then we would be able to do clinical trials with 50 or 60 patients. So this is a priority, absolute priority. We need to think about mechanisms, this, bridging this gap between animals and humans, because then this will help us to know when to deliver some of these therapies. Okay, thank you. So I'm not in the habit of putting my picture up on slides, but I was asked to do that. 
Um, if anybody's interested in some of the, the plasticity-related things, I, there's a, a review article there which covers a lot of that stuff. And there's some further reading. Thanks for your attention.